I felt so close to them, uh, and, and that helped me as a, as a child just to have that connection with people. And, and they all, again, they were very caring and loving to me, so. Oh, it was way different, um, it, it, mainly because of the, the set, the way the cast and the crew were so much like a family. It, it was not like any other uh, show that I worked on or any other set that I worked on. And um, so that's what made it different. I, everyone just got along so well. Um, it, the set had a whole different feel to it than, uh, than the other sets that I'd been used to at that time. So that's what made it special. Yeah, especially for me, because at the time, uh, I, th I think it was about 14 when I started as Jamie, and uh, I grew up without a father, so I didn't have a, you know, I had a single mom that was uh, having her own set of problems too, and so it was kind of nice to have that family feeling and work at the same time, so that's what made it special for me, and uh, especially, you know, later on in the show when Jamie's adopted, I kind of, <laughs> that gave me a really good feeling, you know, feeling that I was really, finally became part of the show then, so. It was more about the relationships, and it's interesting too because one of the things that makes Bonanza so popular today, and it, it still is seen in, in reruns and all around the world, it's very popular. But uh, the reason why is that really the moral fabric of the stories and uh, the characters. Um, like you said, originally I think Bonanza started out as more of a shoot 'em up kind of a show. But as the actors, uh, you know, they all started getting into their characters and kind of forming who, who the characters were. And as years went on, it gradually turned into uh, what Bonanza ended up being. And uh, what I find so interesting is uh, when you think about it, it's a single father raising three sons. So it's, it's a single parent uh, home, basically. And so it, it does make it very uh, apropos today, you know. And then, uh, and Lauren Green was a perfect father, you know, the perfect, he, not only was he the, a good Ben Cartwright, but he was, he was kind of like the, the father of everybody. He was the father of the set, you know, everybody looked up to him like that, so. First of all, they encouraged us to, uh, I was never discouraged from giving any ideas or, uh, and I think it started with David Dortort. He was the creator of the show. The producers certainly were very interested in it and uh, always, again, available to uh, talk to if you had any ideas. So everything was very uh, open, and uh, we were all always encouraged to, to do our own thing. And, and that kind of, it, it came from uh, Lauren Green, Michael Landon, Dan Blocker. Everybody just kind of, you know, they knew their characters very well, and they wanted to make little changes and things. And I really believe it was a team effort when it gets right down to it. And it wasn't just among the actors, but the cast and the crew together, uh, all the crew. I mean, they'd been together uh, when the show was canceled. I think it was in its 14th season, and I was only there for the last three. So, but I, my understanding was the majority of the, of the crew was there in the show the whole time. So when I came onto the show, again, it was just like a big family. You know, there was a lot of joking around. There was a lot of, uh, you felt very comfortable. But yet there was also a very serious side. So when it got time to, you know, uh, do, do the scenes and, and start filming, you know, every now and then we'd maybe have a take messed up from a little shenanigan here and there. But for the most part, uh, when it got time to, to actually work and, and film, then people got serious and did what they had to do. But it was a nice combination of the two. I know it was fun to do, yeah. I'm not, it probably is unique, at least from now that I think about it. Um, because I did several Gunsmoke episodes, and even though they had little slants of humor in it, I think you're right. I mean, there were shows uh, like Haas and the Leprechauns, and, and shows were just flat out, you know, a comedy from, from beginning to end. And so, yeah, that, that might, been, might have been uh, something special about Bonanza. <laughs> I think that, uh, especially from what I understand, when he first started writing, um, he would do his thing on the stage, and he would complete his little Joe character, and then he would go hang out in the in the uh, editing rooms and, and talk to the editors. And he would he really took his time. And it's one thing he did with me is he took me aside and he kind of told me that because he was close to my age when Bonanza started, and he told me about how he went and he tried to learn different aspects of the industry, and that was something that he'd always wanted to do. So when it came time for him to you know start writing. Uh, it was like natural, and it, um, 
uh, I believe he's he's really gifted, and he's I think he's much pretty much a genius in some ways. I really was impressed with him. He would just the way he would direct. You, you know, um, you could just look at his face. At least I had worked with him for a while, so maybe I had a little advantage there. But uh, he wouldn't have to say a lot. He, he would just maybe say a few words, and it, it was quick and to the point, and you knew exactly what he wanted. And he knew exactly what he wanted. That was another thing as far as, you know, uh, there are some directors that are kind of feeling their way through as they're filming and figuring how many shots. Well, he had it down to where when he came to the set, he already knew how many close-ups and what kind of shots he was going to take where or when. And so much so that... Uh, like if there was a problem with a set, he would say, well, don't worry about that wall because I'm not going to use that. You know, I, uh, this is a shot that I'm going to take there, so we don't need to spend time doing that. And he, you know, he'd do things like that. But, um, and I, I just uh, like his style of writing. It's just very emotional, and I, I think it, uh, it really strikes a chord with, you know, families and um, I think people's emotions. I think he was able to, out of his uh, shows that he wrote, uh, I, I believe it really touched people's emotions. He was part of Bonanza since he was like 18 or 19, and I think that he had a, a real love for it. And so uh, I believe he just, that just came to him naturally because he was interested in it, and I believe he had a deep love for it, and he just kind of, you know, grew into what he did over the years by getting involved and. Um, I, I, I wish I could remember the story about when he finally wrote his first show, but I know he, he made some kind of deal with, with the producers. I don't remember exactly what it is, but uh, they, they let him write a script, and, and I remember them saying that they were blown away and how good the script was. Another thing that was interesting about him directing is he trusted his assistant director and a couple other crew members, so much so that when his character was in the show that he had written and he's directing it, he would really, uh, back then they didn't have the instant replay like they do nowadays. So uh, he would finish a scene and then he would go over and talk to his assistant director and you know, a couple other people, the producers sometimes would be there. And he would trust their, if they would say, well, Mike, I think you can maybe do it a little different. And they would tell him about it and they'd go, okay, and then you'd try that. But once they said that it was good, then he trusted them and he moved on. So he not only, he wasn't just all self-centered and thinking that, you know, I'm directing so I'm gonna do this my way. He was very much interested in getting feedback from the people around him when he was in front of the camera. So I, I thought that was interesting. I played snooker. Uh, snooker is a form of pool. And uh, he was, you know, they were all really nice people. But when you're in a show for a long time, you know, you ha some people have a little bit of a celebrity air around them, which is okay if it's, you know, it's not, uh, you know, overly done or if it's not in a conceited way. But, um, Everybody on the show, even though you can tell that they were kind of celebrities, it was never in a conceited way. It was more of just, they have a celebrity air. But Dan Blocker was the most down to earth. He was the most like, you know, a, a guy that you'd go out and have a beer with, you know. So uh, we started playing snooker, and he had a snooker table at his house. And I remember that uh, one of my fondest memories of him is, uh, uh, about a year before he died, he, his doctor said he really had to start losing some weight because it, it was getting dangerously, you know, heavy and it was going to start affecting his health. So we, when we go over to his house, the, when he was on a diet, he'd have a bowl about this big full of green jello and then he'd have a six pack of uh, seltzer waters and that's what he'd eat is this big jello and the seltzer waters. And he would wear uh, bib overalls with no shirt underneath. And he's a pretty hairy guy, too, so it was kind of funny to see that. And uh, he wore a little uh, Levi kind of beanie cap. And he was just a lot of fun to be around. But the, the first time we went over, I noticed that above his fireplace, he had a painting that looked like of a, some kind of a, 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 a captain, uh, like of a Civil War captain, kind of a close-up, you know. And I just remember while we were playing, I'd, I would look up and... I could have sworn I thought the eyes was looking straight ahead, and, and I looked up, and I was looking to the right, and I didn't think twice about it, and we kept on playing. I looked up, and the eyes were all of a sudden looking to the left, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, what's going on here? But I was afraid to say anything, because I thought maybe, because I really wasn't paying close attention. So then I looked up, and the eyes were crossed, and then I knew something was up. It was a trick painting that he had, <laughs> and it was, it, it was electrified, so he could change the eyes by pressing a button, 
And so that's just the, the kind of guy he was. He, was a, he had a great sense of humor, and he loved to play practical jokes and things like that. So in later years, Haas's character, I think, deepened a little bit more. But he, he was a very smart man. I mean, you know, he wasn't somebody that, yeah, when I say he was down to earth, I mean that uh, just in a kind of a warm, interactive way with people. Uh, again, he, he didn't give off any airs at all that he was a celebrity. And uh, you could tell he loved his family very much, he deeply loved his family. And that had a lot to do, I think, too, with the, the way that he made Haas. Uh, yeah. His early bonanzas, like the first year, uh, everybody, it was more like a regular cowboy shoot 'em up kind of show. And they were talking about how many guys they were going to have to beat up today to, to protect the Ponderosa, you know, and things like that. And, uh, I do uh, understand that uh, Lauren, it was important to him to make his character deeper and more, again, the relationship with the father and the sons came out to be more important and making his character, you know, m more layered rather than just, uh, you know, the tough guy that's protecting his home all the time. And I think he, he was brilliant in, in doing that with the character. You know, uh, yeah, female actresses were always afraid <laughs> to come on the show because they knew they'd get killed off somehow. But um, I, I don't know. I, I, I never saw that it was intentionally uh, supposed to be male-dominated, but I think just the way that the show was written kind of suggested that because it was, it was all uh, male. And certainly the fact that really none of their marriages did end up, you know, lasting, uh, that you might have a point there <laughs> that might have been because they wanted to, to keep that uh, particular factor in the show. By the time I was there, he came at all the right times. You know, he, he came when it was important. Uh, I know that when I first started, he was there. Um, and, but for the most part, he kind of let it run itself. He had excellent producers with um, uh, Kent McRae and, um, oh gosh, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, uh, but Richard Collins, yeah, the excellent producers, and they were there all the time, and, and they care a lot about uh, being there not only for the actors, but for the show as well, and uh, so they, they weren't just yes men saying yes to everybody, they were there to make sure that, you know, I, probably the David Dortort's, you know, uh, concept of the show was going to, uh, they probably, because they knew him very well, of course, so they were probably like his right hands, and um, uh, yeah, but David Dortort didn't mean he didn't show up either. Uh, there were times where he would come to the show, especially if we had like a special, uh, special guest star or uh, the show itself. The, the content of the show was, uh, you know, kind of different and something that Bonanza hadn't done before. So he, he, he definitely showed up when he needed to, but he also let, let everyone else do their thing as well. I remember uh, Michael wrote a show called The Wish, which w uh, had a little black boy in it. And what I found that was really interesting about that was even though he had to, because in those days, of course, there was a lot of racism, and, but when he wrote those characters, he did it in such a way that I think the racism might have been hinted at. But, but what he would do is that his characters would cut through that and so you, you ended up, as, a, as watching the show, you ended up caring about this person uh, more for the situation that the character is in as opposed to, you know, getting too political and too wrapped up in, you know, the, the, the racism thing. I think it's probably easy to, you know, they have the phrase, use the race card. And I think that if that, I think if that was overdone too much, it would have come off more political. But at least in my opinion, what, what I saw happen with the shows that I was involved with, um, it kind of cut through the political part of it and showed that person or that character as you know, a real person and going through the things that they were going through. So in a way, it kind of it, it avoided being too politicized, which I think was a good, good thing. That's another thing, too. They were very respectful to me as a young boy. Um, I know that the language was cleaned up probably quite a bit <laughs> when I was on the show. Um, and not that they were all filthy mouthed or anything, but I know that, uh, I know that they watched themselves whenever I was on the set. So uh, things didn't ever get uh, out of hand like that. I, I don't even remember any kind of discussions or disagreements um, were never overblown. The, there was no stopping off the set and locking themselves in their dressing room, you know, until they decided to come out again, which I've been on shows where that's happened. And um, so it was never like that. They didn't really, 
if they disagreed, at least it wasn't around me. And uh, if they, the disagreements I did see were very, you know, done very professionally and, and loving. I, again, they loved each other. So it was like that kind of a family. You're going to have a fight with your brother and your sister sometimes, but you still love them. And I, that, was, that was the kind of thing that they had on the set. Well, I know I did, but I don't know if <laughs> they probably did too, but they probably didn't let me know too much about it because, again, I, being so younger, you know, I was just uh, pleased to be there. And I had done gun smokes too, and I, I enjoyed that very much as well. But um, I don't remember them actually talking about the competition too much. I'm sure in, their, in uh, the meetings with the producers and as they were getting ready to plan the next upcoming show, I'm sure that would have been a topic there, but uh, it didn't come into play too much with us preparing each of the episodes. It was similar to Bonanza's, um, so it, I remember it being a very pleasant set to work on, but there was just something about the Bonanza set that, again, a family kind of link that I didn't experience on any other set, actually. And, but the Gunsmoke set uh, was very professional and uh, very nice people, and I, I remember enjoying working uh, with uh, James Arness and, and all of the cast and crew. Uh, I really enjoyed doing the show, um, but I don't remember it being the same kind of family feel uh, as Bonanza. And uh, you know, James Arness, rightfully so, he was the star of the show, so uh, it kind of everything kind of revolved around him. Now that might just be, you know he was the main star of Gunsmoke, whereas Bonanza, you've got four, uh, you know, in some cases three or four main stars. So, you know, it was a little different show to start with. That kind of encouraged, I think, the family, uh, you know, environment. But uh, I still really enjoyed working on Gunsmoke. Well, it was very well done. Um, and I think it was really good writing. I know that the shows I did, I, I'm still very proud of them, uh, especially uh, there's one that I did with David Wayne um, and uh, I just loved the, the interplay between he, he played a judge and I played uh, the son of a, a man who was kind of a, a loser and uh, uh, he ends up getting killed and my character as the son uh, is uh, kind of taken in by David Wayne as the judge uh, is trying to clean him up and you know uh, Anyway, the interaction between David Wayne's character and my character, I think, was just really well written. In fact, they were thinking they were talking about possibly writing a, a series uh, based on the two characters, but didn't come to true. But <laughs> they talked about it anyway. Well, my horse, his name was Pee Wee, and um, they picked him out because they knew uh, me being young. I I, I rode very well because I had done a movie before Bonanza called The Reavers, which there was a horse race sequence in it. So I learned how to uh, ride for that, and because I did a lot of westerns even before that. So I was very comfortable on the horse, but still at the same time, they wanted to get me a horse that was dependable and was quiet, so it didn't get riled up by noise on the set. And actually, all their horses were the same way. They were all very well trained, and you know, uh, an arc lamp could blow up right next to them, and you know, they might jump a little bit, but I've been on sets where horses will just flat take off, and you know, and in fact, that happened to me on the on the English style horse when I was uh, rehearsing for the Reavers. Uh, the horse just decided to get spooked, and it took me about a quarter of a mile to slow him down before I could finally stop him. But uh, Pee Wee was always just a very gentle horse, and I what was neat is that they'd let me you know go riding at lunchtime and stuff like that. So you know, through the the streets of the back lot, and uh, you know. Uh, in the uh, wooded areas and things on the studio. So, uh, you know, that's the, kind of my special memories of the horses. And not only was he just a good horse for, for the show, but uh, he was just a great horse all the way around. It's like a summer camp that <laughs> doesn't stop and you get paid. So, um, yeah, it really was, especially at the age that I was at. And, and like I said, too, the, the family connection was something that I really needed in my personal life. So um, I, I never let that get out of hand. It's not like I was, you know, uh, pretending that I was their son or anything, but I, the, I felt so close to them, uh, and, and that helped me as a, as a child just to have that connection with people. And, and they all, again, they were very caring and loving to me, so that made, that made it even better. But the, yeah, the fun things were when you can go take a break and run around, and we'd, we'd shoot on locations that would have caves and, you know, things like that. And, uh, I used to love it too when we'd shoot in the snow because I didn't go to the snow a lot when I was a kid. So 
being in the snow was a lot of fun too. A lot of snowball fights. <laughs> oh, he was like a dad to me during the filming. Um, he took me under his wing. I'd stay at his house a lot. He had a son, Chad, that uh, was a year or two younger than me, I believe, and um, I got along well with him. Uh, and yeah, he'd ask me over to stay over, and of course he loved to ride motorcycles, so uh, to the producer's horror, he would take a motorcycle and I'd you know, sit on the front and I'd hold onto the handlebars like this, and they'd look up and here we're doing like 70 miles an hour around a track, and they're going, Steve, <laughs> bring him in, come on, don't, don't do that. Um, you know, and he, he'd still do it because he, he loved driving and loved motorcycles. But uh, uh, I used to ride his son's uh, mini bikes all the time. And uh, over the filming of the show, I turned 13 years old, and we were filming at the MGM Studios, the back lot at the uh, train station there. And uh, the, uh, when I was close to turning 13, the assistant director came, and he seemed like he was really upset with me. And I, I didn't know why. He goes, Mitch, come on, we've been looking all over for you. Come on, we get, hurry up, we've got to get this scene done. So I'm going, okay, and I, I'm following them out, and we're coming around the train, and as soon as we stepped around the train, they had a little yellow mini bike that Steve McQueen had Von Dutch, who made the car in the Reavers, and Von Dutch is known for inventing the pinstripes that he could paint by hand on motorcycles and things, and this bike was all painted up and pinstriped by Von Dutch, and it was a present for me, and it said the Reavers on the back had my name on the engine and everything, and uh, I still, I think I have a, a home movie of Steve t telling me that this is from the cast and crew and happy birthday and that was uh, an incredible time for me. <laughs> well, I believe you, you do believe it's going to have some kind of impact on people. Um, I think that's, you know, anybody that takes their craft seriously, they, they, they want to do something where it's going to have some impact because that's why people want to watch the, the shows is that it, it does have an impact, but then there's that, I guess, that line that can be crossed or something where you believe you're putting forth something that's very creative and it's making people think. You see, if you can have a show that gets people on both sides talking about it, I think that's fine. But as far as taking it as far as blaming uh, for the acts of a few people doing horrible things, I, you know, I, I'm a, you know, I, I really think that parents taking, you know, control of, of their children and parents being there for children. I, there's I, just the single family or a single parent um, rate just seems so high these days. And I, I, I think that's important though too. Even if it is a single parent, I believe that that parent, it's a parent's responsibility, I believe, to raise their kids to make the right decisions and think for themselves. And you know, I, I know it's much easier said than done and I'm not saying it is easy, but uh, I'm just so blessed. I have two daughters that um, I just couldn't be more proud. And, um, you know, we've tried to do that with them. <clears throat> As they got older, they would see things that maybe we'd look and oh, you really want to watch that? And, and they will, but at least I could relax knowing that I, I, you know, believed in them enough and trusted them enough to make the right decisions after seeing something in a show. So. First of all, I think the action, uh, you know, quotient part of it is important. Uh, you know, everybody likes action. And, um, uh, you know, those were the days when people carried guns and, you know, it was, you, you kind of had to have that gun because you never knew when somebody was going to try to kill you or, you know, somebody would come out of a saloon drunk and start shooting up and you had to defend yourself. And um, I think in a way that's kind of how we are <laughs> today with, um, the internet. I mean, I kind of look at the internet <laughs> as a big, you know, Wild West thing because there's there's no way to to have a hold on it. There's, you know, you, I'm sure they're going to try to put some kind of laws, and but it really is when you push that button and you do a search, you just never know what's going to come up. And uh, anyway, I don't know how I got off on that, <laughs> but um, um, I think people like the westerns. Uh, again, when at least the people that I've talked to, when they combine a good story and maybe even a moral. Uh, moral at the end of the story with that kind of action with the, and with the animals. You know, I know that there's a lot of animal lovers out there, so to see a gorgeous horse, you know, uh, riding, you know, uh, or, or a man riding a horse, you know, it, it, again, it's a combination of the, um, the action and then the moral story and the heroes, you know, the, the good guys and the bad guys, you know. Um, I think that we all just we have a, a, an attraction to that.